uh, I trust everybody has, um, has a handout. Uh, let me just uh, begin by asking if there are any questions from last week, if everybody understood, um, uh, in essence, what the gospel is. Um, it's, thankfully, it's not terribly complicated, but when you get down into all the nuts and bolts of everything that goes into it, it can, of course, become very complicated. But the, um, when the apostles went out uh, to preach or the disciples to witness, um, we do need to realize that in many cases they, there was a lot of information that the people already had. Uh, they were already convinced, for instance, in Israel that God existed, and the one thing they weren't convinced about was um, that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was their Messiah. So they did have to do some work in that area. But as you go into the Gentile areas that had no background in this, um, at least excluding the God-fearers who had joined themselves with Israel, there was a, a good deal of work that you had to do. You, you'll find Paul, for instance, uh, as he's preaching the gospel to the philosophers on, on Mars Hill, making reference to uh, natural revelation, which is uh, what we're going to look at this morning, as a means to show them what they already know, that is, that God exists, and then to tell them, tell them about this God and what this God has done in order to save them. So in essence, that's uh, what we need to do as well in many cases, is to show people what they really already know. And the reason why uh, we have to show them is because sin tends to um, cause a person to, uh, to sort of push that knowledge out of their minds. They don't want to think about it, uh, as we'll see in Romans chapter 1. As a matter of fact, that'd be a good place to start. There's uh, no questions about uh, any of this, or if there is, you can ask at any time. But let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Just to be reminded what Paul tells us, again, through the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, remembering that this is God's word, it is certainly what Paul intended to write and uh, certainly what the Lord intended for him to write and what it is he wanted us to know. But if we look at... Um, Beginning in verse 18, uh, we see that God has revealed himself in the creation, and we also see what men do with that, uh, that revelation and why it is that we need to uh, know how to show people that uh, God does reveal himself in the creation so that they can basically stop uh, denying it. Uh, and even if, they, uh, even if they do deny it, even if they, uh, they don't stop denying it, which many people will do to the end of their lives, they still know this, they still know God exists, and they're still without excuse. It doesn't matter what they choose to believe, they, they know the truth. Okay. So Romans uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And it goes on to talk about how they uh, took what they knew about God and they reduced God to one of the creatures and worshiped the creature rather than the creator and because of that, God continually gave them over to greater and greater sins. But Paul clearly tells us here that God made himself known, that everyone sees it. God made it evident to them that he exists, but yet they suppress that knowledge. And so the, uh, the purpose of apologetics is really to uh, remove, as uh, R.C. Sproul said, the mask of hypocrisy. They've, they've covered their, their mind, they've covered their face, they're acting as though God doesn't exist when in fact uh, they know he exists. And you, what you do is you bring them face to face with God. Uh, another, though, very important um, uh, effect that apologetics has is um, to help us in dispelling our doubts because our sin uh, that still remains inside of us still is working against us. And one of the things it, it tries to do is to cover the knowledge of God too. And sometimes we may find ourselves as uh, believers uh, doubting whether God exists. I don't know if you've had that experience, but it's not an uncommon experience. Uh, that's, of course, when your graces are low, when, when uh, perhaps you've fallen into sin or have grown um, lax in, in using the means of grace. The Holy Spirit, is, as our confession reminds us, as the Word of God says, is the one who gives us full conviction that these things are true. But sometimes if his influence in us is weak, then 
our conviction isn't very strong. And at times like that, um, we may not feel motivated to get back into the Word of God, but at times like that, natural revelation can help us because it, it will push us that direction. As we uh, consider uh, what God has revealed about himself, we'll find that we really, there's no way to deny it. It'll be so firm and, and sure in our minds that uh, it will push us back to the Word. All right, well, let's then look at um, apologetics. Let's look at uh, some of the ways that... Um, we can approach the subject and some of the ways by which God reveals himself uh, in the creation. And I believe all of these methods really uh, seek to prove the validity, of course, the, the, the fact that God exists and the, the fact that the Bible is his word. Uh, those two things, not just one, not just that God exists, not just that the true God exists, but that he exists and the Bible is his word. Because if you don't get to the Bible, you really haven't accomplished what you need to accomplish. Okay, so the, let me just quickly uh, review the different types of uh, uh, apologetics that there are. There's basically three categories. The first is called evidential, uh, the second classical, and the third presuppositional. Maybe you've heard those uh, terms before. Uh, some of the modern adherents to um, uh, evidential apologetics um, include Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, uh, ICR, which is very much you know, creation science. I suppose we could put answers in Genesis here as well, and there are other organizations like it. Uh, John Warwick Montgomery, apparently, was very strong in this, uh, this area, and Norm Geisler, uh, who has written, I believe, numerous books on apologetics. But basically, this method seeks to prove the truth of the Bible, and by pro proving the truth of the Bible, prove that God exists. Okay, so it starts by trying to validate the Bible, and the way that it does is through what the Bible says inside itself, as far as its internal consistency and so forth, and also what it says that um, really couldn't be said unless God had spoken in it. In other words, fulfilled prophecy, miracles, and things like that. So basically, if you've read evidence that demands a verdict, you'll find that, that there's numerous prophecies in, that it deals with regarding Christ, and his coming that were prophesied hundreds of years, thousands of years before he came, and then you see the fulfillment of it, and then it assures you that uh, what we have in the scripture is God's word because only God can tell the future. Or it will compare what the Bible predicts in other areas with archaeology and demonstrate again that what it says is true. And then the point is this, that if we can see that it says things that, that come to pass that only God could know in advance, if those things are the word of God, then of course the things that we can't uh, necessarily examine, um, other claims perhaps the Bible makes, must be true as well. Okay, so the idea is that uh, by showing that this is the word of God through fulfilled prophecy mainly, then we can know that the Bible is his word and everything that it says is true because God doesn't lie. Okay, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. We'll just move to the next one, classical apologetics. Uh, this one actually takes a, a more philosophical approach to um, uh, showing the existence of God. And by the way, some people get hung up on the idea of trying to prove that God exists. You shouldn't try to prove it. God does exist, you know, whether you prove it or not. And granted, I mean, he does exist. Uh, we're just trying to show people that he exists. Our proving it doesn't make it happen. It just simply shows that it does happen in case you, or that it is true in case you have that particular run into somebody who may have said something like that. But uh, this, this method is actually quite simple. It's, um, it, at least it can be simple, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, it can also be very complicated. But it just asks one basic question. Um, that is, an argument, what we say from, from causality. Causality usually just asks the question, why? Okay, and you know, I mean, if, if you say, you know, uh, questions like this, uh, you know, why, why do you exist? Where did you come from? Well, who caused you? And, and then what caused the person who caused you? I mean, you came from your parents, your parents came from their parents, and you keep asking questions like that, and you keep going back, what caused this? What caused this? What caused this? So I suppose we, we should simply say, you know, what we're talking about cause. What is the cause? What is the cause of this? Why, is it, why are things the way that they are? And as we go back through the chain of causality, we, we eventually arise, arrive at the first cause, okay? Now, this is what we're going to look at this morning after I preview one other um, 
uh, one other uh, school of apologetics. But, okay, let me just say this, that the character and the characteristics of God, uh, his attributes as well as what he is like, these are all deduced from what we see in, in the natural revelation in, in nature. And then in order to get to the scriptures, what they do is they, 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 first of all, deduce what God is like from the creation. And there's a great deal that we can know. As a matter of fact, it's been said that um, some people, uh, some Christian philosophers, perhaps Christian apologists or even philosophers may have deduced more about God from the creation than most Christians can from their Bibles because most Christians don't read their Bibles and seek to understand what it says. Okay, so there's a lot that you can know about God through the creation. But once you find out what he is like, then basically you survey the different uh, religious books that have been written and you find that really only the Bible reveals that God that we see in, in the creation. And then you add to that the things that um, we've seen under evidential apologetics. Not only does this, does this book reveal the God that we see, but this book tells us that this God has revealed himself here and then we see the many evidences that he has. So it's sort of adding another layer of, um, of confirmation that the Bible is his, uh, his word. And then there's what's called presuppositional apologetics. And, and this is the more modern approach um, and one that's uh, very prevalent within our denomination. Uh, that um, was originated, I suppose, by Cornelius Van Til or saying that, uh, in saying that I might be, um, I think I'm probably... Uh, not putting it just exactly right. I mean, for instance, Darwin, we say, is sort of the originator of, of the theory of evolution, but he wasn't, okay? He was the one who popularized it. He sort of filled it out more. Evolutionary thought existed for years before that, okay? Well, presuppositional thought also existed before Cornelius Van Til, but he was the one who sort of systematized it and made it very popular. And of course, Greg Bonson, as one of his disciples, was. Uh, was probably the one considered to be his um, successor. And then John Frame, I guess it was a toss up between the two, but I think they finally gave it to uh, Greg Bonson. <laughs> okay, but basically this, this method begins with the existence of God and with the validity of scripture and simply assumes that as, as, a, as a presupposition and they say it is necessary for you to believe these two things if you're going to make sense out of anything that you see, okay? So uh, basically they, they would show that um, unless you, you assume that God exists from the very beginning of your quest for knowledge, and unless you assume that the Bible is the word of God, you actually are not going to arrive at um, truth, at least if you do, you're not going to be able to prove that you have. These are necessary assumptions at the very beginning. And I, I think that the main reason behind this is, is if there is no God, then there can be no reason and uh, because there wouldn't be rationality. We're going to see that in this argument from causality. Uh, there would be no grounds upon which to believe that what I'm saying to you has any meaning or significance at all. It would just be the random collision of molecules that have no rhyme or reason. You see, there has to be a reason for rationality. There has to be a reason why things make sense. Uh, and it's not just an accident that occurred that would not uh, that that could not um, justify uh, the fact that I'm saying anything meaningful. I don't know if if, if that doesn't make sense, but uh, uh, the idea basically is uh, without a reasoner who created us, we can't know that we have true reason. So what they would say is, people who actually do have true knowledge have borrowed upon that capital. They have actually assumed the existence of rationality. They've assumed the they've assumed the existence of God. And they have reasoned that way, even though they deny him, they still assume a universe that could only exist if God exists. In other words, they assume a kind of universe that could only exist if God exists. They're, they're stealing capital from Christianity, in other words, in order to know what they know. And they're, they're doing that in order to deny him, as I've said, to build arguments against him. So that's one of the things that presuppositional apologetics will do is that they will show other systems of thought that they have no grounds to believe what they believe or to even know that they know anything and show them that their whole system doesn't even allow for knowledge, doesn't allow for, uh, you know, I guess for any, any truth of any kind to, to know any facts and to know that you know them. 
And uh, after they show the absurdity of their particular system, then they would show, of course, the reasonableness of the Christian, uh, the Christian worldview and show them that this is the only view that makes sense. So basically, they're simply promoting a theistic and biblical worldview at the very outset rather than trying to argue towards it, like the classical apologists might do. They argue from it. And it's just another way of, uh, of proving, again, the fact that God exists. Now, there, there are many good books on the subject, and all of these, I believe, are, uh, I might, you know, well, not everybody necessarily believes this, but I believe each one of these methods is certainly a valid method, and I think you can use any or all of them to, um, to show what you want to show. And, of course, the more that you learn about these things, uh, the more effectively you can, you can do that. Uh, I, what I want to do this morning is develop a, the, uh, the classical method, uh, the classical argument, uh, basically Jonathan Edwards' argument for the existence of God. And uh, it really does argue from the creation to, um, to show that God exists. And it shows us exactly what, um, what Paul said should be true, uh, that God does reveal himself in the creation. We can see that. And when we ask the question why or what caused this, it will bring us back to God, not just to a God, not just to any God, but to the biblical God, the true God. Are there any questions up to this point? Is everybody with me or am I, have I confused everyone? Okay. Well, let's look at Edward's argument for God's existence. And um, it, it's really a simple argument, but again, it can be a very complicated argument as well. Um, it's, it's really the argument from what's called necessary being. So let's just say uh, we're talking about being, something that exists, something that must necessarily exist. So let me just put an abbreviation here for necessary being. And his argument basically goes like this, and, and you've probably heard this before, but hopefully it'll be a little clearer after we're done. He, he reasons that it's impossible that there could be in, in any place in the universe nothing. Okay, nothing can't exist. As a matter of fact, nothing by definition doesn't exist, right? Now, if it's impossible that nothing could exist, then something must necessarily exist. Is that twisting your mind yet? Okay, okay good. Now, that necessary thing that must exist, that necessary being, is God. Okay? He is the only, th the only thing that must exist. Now, I hope you get the point. Um, nothing, by the way, is not, is not the absence of substance. I mean, if we, if we call this, let's say, space, and there's nothing in this space, you know, no matter in the space, we don't say that this is nothing, okay? An empty void, a vacuum is still something. It's, it's got dimensions. You can, you know, you, you can measure it. You can know its cubic, uh, its volume, you know, I mean... Uh, you can know its density. There's a lot of things you can say about space. So we're not talking about nothing here. Nothing means absolutely nothing. That means uh, Edwards, uh, this is probably the best way to explain it, but he says nothing is what the sleeping rocks dream of. <laughs> nothing, right? <laughs> that, that's nothing. Space is not nothing. It's something. Now, can you conceive of a place in the universe where there's nothing? Can you conceive of nothing existing? Can you conceive of, of the idea that, that uh, there was a time when there was nothing? Nothing at all. What the sleeping rocks dream of. No. Something has always had to exist. The fact that something is here now means that something must have always been. There could never have been nothing. So it's necessary that something exists. And basically, it, in the way he understands this, and we'll sort of unfold this in a minute, this already proves to him that God exists. Okay. But we'll see that there's a lot more that we can know about uh, God than just the fact that he's necessary, a necessary being. Because whatever it is that has existed from all eternity is the cause of what we see now. And since the cause is always greater than the effect, whatever we see in the effects must be in the cause. Okay, so then look around, you know, at yourself. Look at, that's basically what we do is we look at everything and we think, oh, okay, well then what caused me must have these attributes, okay? So that's, uh, that's what we're going to look at here in just a moment. So let's begin here. Now, something exists now, therefore something must always have existed because it's impossible that there could be nothing, okay? 
That's where we begin. Now, he begins to fill out what this necessary being is like. There are certain things we can know about him. We can know that he is um, infinite. We can know that he's one. We can know that he is independent of everything else, and we can know that he's unchangeable. Now, look, look at these arguments. He must be infinite because it's impossible that nothing could exist. This necessary being extends everywhere, right? Because there aren't places in the universe or in, in existence where there's nothing, right? So this necessary being extends infinitely. That's, that's how large it is, okay? And wait a minute, I think I forgot to put one other thing in here. Oh, yeah, I forgot to put eternal. Oh, wait, no, no, okay. Well, I forgot to explain eternal. Now, it's impossible that there could be nothing at any time. Something exists now. Something has always existed, right? So whatever this necessary being is, not only is he everywhere because nothing doesn't exist, but because there could not have been a time when nothing existed, he has always been, okay? So he is eternal, or I should say this being is eternal. We have to get to personality. Well, we get pers to personality a little bit further down the line. Now, he argues that this infinite, eternal being must also be one because you can't have two infinites. The idea is um, if something is infinite, it basically fills all things. And it is the only thing that can exist because if there is anything else that exists, then it would limit this, okay? So you, you have an infinite being. You can't have a limitless number of finite beings because that would never be enough to be infinite, okay? But you have to have something that is infinite to cover everything. And so basically he's saying is you can't have two infinites, so there must just be one. So this being that necessarily exists is one. That, that might be a little bit harder to grasp. He would say that this being is independent, which means it doesn't depend on anything else for its existence because, again, it's, it's infinite. It's, it's the only thing that does exist. It's eternal. And if there's nothing else, there's nothing really around that could make it change. It will simply be what it is. And uh, let's see. Oh, um, oh I should say there's, there's nothing upon which it would depend for its existence. That's what independence means. Um, it is the thing that has been around from all eternity. It is infinite. It's one. There is nothing then it could depend on. It must be independent. It exists in and of itself. Okay. And then the last one is it's unchangeable. Okay. Which uh, basically means because there is only one being that has existed from all eternity that, and there's nothing that could actually influence it in any way, then there's really no reason for it to change. So. Okay, this, this is getting a bit philosophical. We're going to get into a little bit simpler argument in, in just a minute once we finish this. <laughs> okay, now what he goes on to say is that this infinite, eternal, you know, simple being that is independent and unchangeable is other than what now appears. What we see as we look at the creation is not infinite. Okay. Certainly the matter is not infinite, right? It's not eternal. Everybody admits that what we see has a beginning. And even scientists are, of course, trying to figure out what that beginning is. And there's been a lot of different theories about how things created a big bang, a big rock that it, that's sort of been in the universe forever, uh, blew up, um, or uh, a microscopic particle of pure matter became unstable and blew up, and, um, or there was nothing. And then there was a fluctuation and nothingness and suddenly poof, the creation, okay? And that might actually be closer to the truth uh, in the sense that um, if, but, but they leave God out of the picture. But if God is in the picture, uh, because uh, basically there was a time when only God existed and then he brings the whole creation into existence. Okay, so what we see is not eternal. It definitely has a beginning. What we see is not infinite. It has limits. I mean, look around you. Uh, there's nothing that we see that has no boundaries, except for one thing. And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, we do see um, that uh, there's not just one thing in this universe that we look at, but there's many. I mean, there's many of us, there's many objects, there's many planets. They're all different in many different ways. What we see is not independent. In other words, it doesn't depend on itself. It doesn't explain itself why it even exists, but it depends on something else. 
And what we see is not unchangeable, but it's constantly changing. And all of this is to say that what we see, the matter that is in the universe, does not explain uh, it, itself. It can't be this necessary, infinite, eternal, simple, independent, and unchangeable being that we must know exists because nothing exists. Now, the only exception to that is space. And here's where we get into that, uh, at least if, um, if that, that question uh, rises again. Edwards believed that the only thing that we cannot conceive of is not, as not existing. I mean, we can, we can, in our minds, we can imagine a universe that is just purely empty space. You know, that, that uh, the planets aren't there, the matter isn't there, the gases aren't there, all the elements, you know, that whole thing. We can imagine that, but we can't imagine a universe without space, can we? It's impossible. You have to have space. If there's going to be something, there has to be a place where, right? There has to be space. So Edwards believed that the space is actually God. Now, um, don't, don't get me wrong on that, okay? He's not saying that, that God is empty space, okay? But what he's saying is that the space in which we live is God, okay? Uh, the idea that Paul has here in, in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, for in him we live and move and exist. We live in him, we move in him, we exist in him. Okay, is, is he talking about that the fact that the space is in fact not empty at all? It is the being of God. I mean, God is everywhere. And again, space is the only thing that you cannot conceive of as not existing. It has to be there. It is necessary, right? But this necessary being that we've been talking about that, that actually is, is other than the created matter, the only thing that's left is really space, and space is just as necessary. So what he is saying is that God is that space, and I, I hope you see the point there. All right, let's see. Now let's get to a little bit more personal here. Um, this being that has these attributes then must be the cause of what we see because what we see cannot have caused itself. It doesn't have these attributes, which it must have if it was its own cause. Uh, we, we know that, that whatever it is that, that made the things that we see, um, that must be this being. It must be the one that, that has existed, the one who is necessary, the one who is eternal, the one who is infinite, because there's no one else that could have done it, okay? He's the only, the only um, would you say, the only candidate that we have. Now, this being, must also have certain attributes besides these. These are attributes as well. But he must have the attributes that we see in this creation because this is the being that caused it. Okay, he made us and whatever we have, okay, he made us, he made people. Whatever we have, he must have because the, um, the effect can't be greater than the cause. Okay, you have to have a sufficient cause for the effect, were the effect. Well, so what is it that's true of us that must be true of him? Okay, well, consciousness, self-awareness, personality, intelligence, volition, which means we have the ability to make choices. We have a desire to make choices, uh, moral. We have a moral capacity to be good or evil. Uh, we look at the creation, we see uh, lots of good things in the creation, lots of food and uh, you know, things to enjoy, flavors, sights, sounds, and so forth. He's benevolent. And we also see a lot of things that we would rather not see, like earthquakes, tidal waves, and things like that. Somehow, this being is angry. So arguing, arguing from the, uh, let's say, the, the cause to the effect and realizing that the cause must be greater than the effect, we see that... Uh, because of what we see in the creation and, of course, man being the greatest creation, we see various things, again, as I said, consciousness, and we see uh, will, uh, we see, um, you know, again, personality, person, we're all different. We see, uh, well, I guess volition is pretty much the same thing as will, isn't it? Intelligence, we have the ability to reason, um, and uh, we see a couple of other things outside of ourselves with regard to the goodness of God and also his anger. So anyway, these are things that, and there's a lot more that could be said, but these are the things that uh, those who study natural theology, uh, the general revelation, that they have been able to deduce from the creation, you know, from asking the question, what caused what we see? 
Okay, all of these attributes as well as these, these particular ones. Now, what they do from here simply to get to the Bible is they, as I mentioned before, they survey the different religious books that claim to be speaking from God, and they see what it is that these books reveal about God. And they find that really the only book that actually explains or, or reveals the same God that we see in the creation is the Bible. And that shouldn't be uh, surprising to us, should it? Okay. It's the, the Bible is the only book that reveals God as infinite, eternal, as one, that is one being. Remember, he's three in person, but one being. He doesn't depend on us, but we depend on him. He's independent of everything. He never changes, and he has these attributes. I guess I forgot to put morality there, too. And by the way, his benevolence and his, uh, his anger also show us something about his, his justice and his righteousness. Okay, so that's the more complicated form of, of this argument. And uh, it takes a while for this to kind of sink in. And some of these links may not look uh, perhaps as strong as they, as they really are. But it is a very sound um, way to, um, to argue the biblical God from creation. But if you run into, usually we run into people that aren't going to be getting into this kind of thinking. You know, they're not going to be able to reason uh, in this way, except maybe some of these things they, they would probably get. I think the one... As far as the idea that nothing can't exist, there can't be any place where there's nothing. Something must have always existed. The fact that something exists now means something has always been. And then you can go straight to this instead of dealing with all of these and begin to talk about what this, this being is like. Because we're talking about uh, ministering mainly, I suppose, to evolutionists who believe that these things came about by some accidental you know, process. Um, but basically, the idea is that um, uh, in, you know, uh, well, billions of years ago, I guess, uh, the, the Big Bang took place. I think it's about four and a half billion years. Uh, several million years ago, at some point, there was a, a primarily hydrogen uh, atmosphere that uh, they call a reducing atmosphere. If it was oxygen, it would destroy these cells that they contemplate or these proteins that they think somehow existed. They had lightning uh, flashing in the atmosphere, in a hydrogen atmosphere. That would be... Interesting to see what would happen if that took place. Um, if there's any oxygen at all, it's just going to go kaboom, you know. But uh, the, the electricity, the sun, all this energy coming into the Earth's um, hydrogen atmosphere and so forth, uh, this uh, water that, that existed that was stirring up some kind of uh, soup of um, a variety of molecules, the electricity then striking the, uh, the, the soup uh, and uh, producing the proteins that... Um, that actually can sustain life and somehow these proteins organizing themselves and I think in order to have one living cell you have to have hundreds of these proteins of different types of proteins in exactly the right sequence and then somehow they have to combine and uh, form a living cell and then somehow that one cell has to survive long enough to reproduce and then it has to be mutated in a beneficial way to, um, to make it a more complex organism that would have a better chance of survival, and that has to go on time after time after time until you get the uh, variety of life and complexity that you see uh, in the world right now. Even though there's no evidence for any of this, there's no missing links for those transitional mutation forms in the, uh, the fossil record, um, there's no evidence that any mutation to our DNA has, has really ever been beneficial, and the ones that they've uh, uh, put forth as, as beneficial um, mutations when I was when we were studying this in college, the one was sickle cell anemia. You know, it gives them a resistance to cholera. Or is it malaria? Cholera, I think. Okay. Um, okay, they don't get cholera, but they die from sickle cell anemia because it makes them dead, deathly ill. Um, they have to wear oxygen, they're in excruciating pain, um, and many die young from that. So um, hardly a beneficial mutation. So uh, those are the kinds of people that we're up against, and they deny the existence of God. But what they want to say, and, and this is the argument that I used one time with an evolutionist, I, just from the, the argument of causality. You're saying that we sprung out of the dirt, out of the, out of the rocks, out of the ground. And yet, look at yourself. You have a mind. You can think. You can reason. You have volition. You have will. You have morality. You have all these things. And I said... Now, do you find those things in the dirt? Well, obviously not. Well, how could this come from that? 
How can the effect be greater than the cause? We know it's a, a, a principle of science that's been proven. You, don't, you, you, you cannot have an effect that's greater than the cause. It, whatever it is that, that causes this, I mean, if you see a car, you know, you don't think, how did, you know, that, that's amazing that that car just, you know, lightning struck the ground and this, this car formed. You know, you, you don't think that way because you realize that um, that doesn't explain. It's not a sufficient cause for the car. You know it requires more than that. And yet, evolutionists believe that lightning basically struck the ground and, and here we are, you know. And we're many times more complicated than the most complicated car that you can imagine. But yet people believe that, but they wouldn't believe the other. So this argument from causality, if we, um, if we look on page three, let, let's just look at a few more of these things. Okay, I already talked about this. I mean, for instance, uh, when you see a person walking down the street, you don't assume that they hatch from a chicken egg, right? Because that wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't explain it, right? They didn't just, you know, the lightning didn't strike the ground and the man sprouted up and so forth because we know, again, the cause wouldn't be great enough. And um, we also know, for instance, as we continue to study the universe, that the universe itself is actually not just a random collection of matter out there, but it's actually an organized system that functions together. The more we learn about the universe, we find that it too is a system that has been designed and, and is functioning according to a specific pattern. That's the reason why we have comets you know, coming by periodically like, like clockwork, you know, uh, Halley's Comet and some of the other comets we might have missed in our lifetime that we'll have to maybe see from heaven. Okay, but, but the universe itself is actually a, a system now, as we look at the world around us, again, there are certain things that we can deduce about the, the, the one who caused us from the creation. For instance, that he is alive and not dead. The ground, the, the dirt, if you were to examine it by every known means of, of um, examining you know, scientifically or whatever, you would find that there's no life in dirt. I mean, you can find bacteria and so forth. But I'm talking about dirt itself. Okay, but. We see life everywhere in the world, don't we? We see, again, plants, insects, animals, man, and so whatever it is that caused us must have life in and of himself. Uh, certainly, he is an infinitely wise designer. I think that one of the things that uh, is, is the greatest apologetic for the existence of God is ourselves. When you consider how complicated our, our bodies are, all the organs, all the systems that exist within us that are all working together to allow us to live, I, I, I forget exactly how the, um, the evolutionist explains it, but I think they, they even posited at one time uh, one organism that was existing and another organism that may have later become kidneys or a stomach or something, somehow getting inside that other organism as a parasite or something and then beginning to function somehow to help that organism, and that's sort of the beginning of, of the systems that we see. But I think you'll, um, you'll understand when you study the human body that such a thing isn't isn't possible. I mean, I just have a list here of the different systems that exist in our body, such as the, uh, the pulmonary system that allows us to be able to get oxygen from, from the air and uh, be able to, doesn't actually transport it to, uh, to where it needs to go, but it's able to, to bring that oxygen in and also to get rid of the waste products that uh, come about from, from um, uh, what is it, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's that? Metabolism, Metabolism. there you go. We have an alimentary system that allows us to eat food and digest that food, break it down into, into its components, and then absorb the nutrients. We have, of course, the uh, circulatory system that's able to take the oxygen from the pulmonary system and the alimentary system, uh, the food from the alimentary system, and transport it to all the different cells. And, and actually, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a system by which it can transmit those molecules into the cell and also receive waste molecules from the cell and then take them to their particular places in order to get uh, rid of them. Otherwise, the waste buildup you know, would kill us. We have a skeletal system that gives structure to our bodies all the, for all these things to hang on you know, and to be contained in, and the muscular system to, to move around and, and to do whatever our, our nervous system will dictate. We have a brain that's basically in control of all of these, uh, all of these systems and keeping them working, you see. Um, and, of course, an immune system that uh, fights off the bacteria and the viruses that gets into our bodies, these foreign objects that allows us to live. We have a sensory system that's also a part of our nervous system. 
you know, sight and hearing and touch and taste and, and uh, I guess I missed one, did I smell? And that allows us to, to gain information from the world outside of us. If we didn't have our sensory system, we'd be walking around blind, blind, wouldn't we? Like a pilot in pitch darkness, uh, <laughs> I mean, with no instrumentation, just you wouldn't even know where he's going or what you're doing. You wouldn't even, you know, you wouldn't know anything around you existed because you couldn't feel anything, you couldn't see anything. So we have this system that the Lord has given to us to be able to bring in all this information and to process it in our minds. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And all of these things are all working together. They're working independently, you know, and they're working collectively to allow us to live, as, as the Lord says, or one of the psalmists in the scriptures, you know, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. It, it really is quite amazing. And if you uh, go actually beyond this to the cellular level, which is what um, our daughter Rebecca has had to do lately, I think, in her biology class. I remember when I was in uh, biology in college that when we studied the inner workings of a cell, I was amazed. I was, it was, I was amazed far beyond what I was amazed just by looking at the human body to see what's going on inside a cell. Uh, it's, it's much more complicated than what's going on in, in your body at, at sort of that level of organs that we just talked about. There's all these processes that are going on. One thing that's, that's really quite amazing is the fact that um, the DNA molecule, which is coiled up inside the nucleus, and there's one inside of each living cell in your body, and there's trillions of cells. Each one of those has a gigabyte of information encoded on it, and it's information that is usable by the cell uh, to maintain the cell and for the cell to function as a kidney cell, as a liver cell, as a, uh, you know, a lung cell, a brain cell, whatever it needs to do. There's RNA molecules that are able to go into the nucleus and unzip the DNA and read the, uh, the information that's on it. They, they close up the DNA molecule, they go out and they find the, the molecules that they need inside the cell that have been transmitted through by the blood, red blood cells. They're able to put those molecules together according to the information they read on the DNA and, and then apply those molecules where they need to be applied inside the cell. Uh, one, if you've seen that movie, um, Expelled, one thing I thought was interesting was uh, uh, Ben Stein asks uh, this, this one professor who um, had taught at several different universities and, and now was in France. I forget his name, but um, he said, if, if Darwin conceived of the human cell as a Buick, I think the Buick was the uh, term he used, how would we how would we conceive of the cell now by comparison? He says, oh, a galaxy. You know, it's, uh, Darwin knew just very little about the cell, but now what we know, it's, it's like a galaxy within itself. And uh, all of those cells, you know, trillions of them are in your body and they're all working the way the Lord made them to work, at least uh, until you round the other side of the, of the age curve and they begin to maybe malfunction a bit because they're not able to duplicate quite as well. Uh, and that's a part of the curse. You know, there's no really scientific explanation for why it begins to make these mistakes, except that uh, uh, the Bible tells us that we're under the curse of death, and so we grow old and die. But they're all working together in order to enable you to live in this particular environment. And that's another thing to think about. All the, all the, the things that go into the world in which we live, and you've probably heard, you know, if the... If the um, Diameter of the earth was just a little bit more or a little bit less. Life wouldn't be uh, possible on this earth. The, the oxygen, the, the, uh, the water, I mean, the, the makeup of the earth is, is just perfectly suited for us to be able to live in it. There, there's just, again, so much design. We, just see, we see design in everything. And these cells, there's plant cells, there's, there's animal cells. I mean, so there's different forms of life uh, that we see as well. If we had a chance to look at it, we can, we can see how some organisms need each other. I mean, we need plants, we need food to live. There's other, um, or, there's other species of animals that, that actually specifically need each other in order to survive. I think that bucket orchid uh, is, is a wonderful example of that. Uh, there's a type of bee and a type of orchid that need each other to live, otherwise they, they couldn't reproduce and they would die off as, as a, uh, both, both of these species would die off. Uh, the, the, the bee is the only bee that's able to transport the pollen that this, this orchid needs in order to cross-pollinate. This orchid is the only plant that produces the wax that the bee needs for its own reproductive cycle. And uh, the way that the, the bucket orchid is able to trap these bees and to glue the, 
the pollen sacs on the back. Basically, the orchid opens in the morning. It drips fluid into its bucket. These bees come out to uh, look for pollen. They, they go to these plants because these plants have the wax they need. They scrape the wax off the plants. And sometimes as they're doing this, the bee falls into the bucket and gets wet. And because it's so steep, it can't get out. And there's only one way out. And so the bee starts to go out that way. And uh, if the, the plant, the, the orchid that it's in happens to be the male, it, it stops the bee. It glues pollen sacs onto its back. And it holds the bee until the, the pollen sacs are actually cemented on, then lets it go. And so it goes flying around. And it's got these pollen sacs on its back that it can't get to because they're on its back. It, it continues to scrape wax, falls into another bucket. If that one happens to be the female, then as it's climbing out through the only way out of the orchid, there's these little openings, these, these little scrapers that come down. And as the bee is working its way to get out of the, out of the plant, it scrapes the, the pollen packs off of its back. And the orchid has been cross-pollinated. Now it can reproduce. And the bee, of course, has been scraping its wax. And now it can reproduce. But these two, plant and insect, they need each other. How could, how could that have developed by any kind of an accidental means? They, they would both have to be together at the same time in order for either species to exist. Right? So again, it just shows us that these things didn't evolve. They just simply were made that way by this cause who has, of course, we, we should also put here infinite power. You know, he's also powerful because he, he did create everything that we see. So let's see. Um, someone's used the example of, um, you know, when we talk about uh, what evolutionists talk about. You have matter. You have uh, energy. They used to believe all you needed was energy to sort of bombard matter, and, uh, and then you come up with uh, organization. And you have a, um, an upward climb towards you know, increasing, um, increasing complexity. But really, what you have is destructive energy because it doesn't have any mechanism to use it. Bombarding matter, all that does is destroy things. I mean, if you put all the uh, materials that you needed to build a house out on an open field and you let the sun beam on it for a number of years, how long will it take before the house gets built? You know, it's not going to get built, is it? It's instead going to dissolve. And those, those things that you put out there, the wood and, and various other things, like you see older houses, they, they get old, they oxidize, they dilapidate, because the energy is destructive. It needs a, it needs a mechanism to um, actually to, um, to make useful work, and there's no mechanism. There has to be an existing mechanism to turn this energy into uh, useful work in order to organize the matter. But uh, even if you do have energy and matter, you wouldn't be able to explain how these came about to begin with. But the energy is not going to, without a mechanism, organize the matter. All it's going to do is disorganize it. Okay? Now, another interesting thing is, um, and this is uh, information science has been bringing this to uh, the forefront, the idea that um, uh, we have all this information, and really scientists cannot explain where the information on the DNA molecule came from. They realize that uh, their explanation of mutation and natural selection does not explain it because there are no examples of information being added to the gene pool. In, in all the, the time scientists have been able to study this and observe it, there's no example of information being added. There is only examples of information being taken away. And that information is taken away through mutation. As a matter of fact, one other beneficial mutation they talked about was um, the idea that if you, if you use an antibiotic on a particular uh, bacteria long enough, that sometimes you get bacteria that, um, uh, that is resistant to that, right? And they say, there, you see evolution. It's the survival of the fittest. These, these bacteria have evolved to the place where they can survive the, uh, the antibiotic. But what really happens is that some of the bacteria lose some information. And the information to produce perhaps a particular protein that that antibiotic was targeting, and now with that protein not inside the, uh, the, the bacteria or the virus or whatever, it, it's not able to target it, and the bacteria survives. So it didn't survive by gaining new information. It survived by losing information. So they, they can't explain where the information comes from, though. Where, where did it all come from? Where did it all begin? You know, the gigabyte of information that's on each DNA. 
And then one thing that Ken Ham brought up in, in a recent seminar that I went to, which I thought was very good, was uh, even if you have information, you know, even if you could explain where the information comes from, you still have to have a mechanism to use the information. You still have to have a context in which this information is useful. You know, where does the context come from? He put a, a word on the board to illustrate this, and it was a word that I was unfamiliar with, and I imagine most people were. He says, what does that word mean? And uh, nobody knew, and he said, well, this is a word in German for something, and he said that this word only makes sense in German. That's because that's its context. Now, we have all this information, and all this information only makes sense in a certain context, right? It's only usable if you have a context that can understand that information and a mechanism actually to put it to use. Well, the thing is you can't explain where the information comes from. You can't explain where the context comes from for that information even to be used. And you can't explain where the mechanism came from for that information to be used to organize matter. Okay? Those are all things that science cannot explain. There's no way that you can explain it. And you know the whole thing about the movie Expelled is uh, what Ben Stein is trying to get across as I believe, uh, not from a distinctively Christian perspective, but from a Jewish perspective, and he believes in creation and so forth, is that the secular realm will not even uh, discuss, will not allow to be discussed the idea, even the hypothesis or, yeah, the hypothesis of intelligent design. It couldn't have been intelligence that did this. It had to be some kind of an accident. And if you even hint towards it, you basically get kicked out of the university as a, even if you happen to be um, somebody who was highly desirable uh, before that time. So anyway, again, you, you've seen several different ways. And actually, if you're just going to talk to somebody, just, you, know, uh, you, can, you can talk about ourselves. You know, this is what we're like, and you believe we came out of the ground. Or you can talk about information. Do you, do you realize that, you know, that the, the DNA molecule has all this information on it? Well, yes. Well, where do you think that information came from? Do you know the scientists uh, have no examples of information being added to that DNA? They have no idea how that information got there, and they can't explain it through evolutionary processes. Do you realize that information would only make sense in a certain context, just like um, you know the word, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, well, think of a word that we don't use in, in our English that might be in another language. Uh, um, I don't know. We, we have so many you know, Spanish words we use and so forth, but... Uh, we don't use the word kyra, for instance. That's a, that's a Greek word. And if I said kyra, you, you'd probably just give me a blank stare because you have no idea what it means because it only means something in its context, right? It means greetings in Greek. Okay, well, here's information, but there's no context for that information. Or how do you explain the context that is able to make sense out of this information? And then where do you get the mechanism to take this information and put it to use? Scientists can't explain any of that. And really, the only thing that can is, of course, an infinitely wise designer who created and encoded that information onto the molecule in created the context and created the mechanism and what, by which to put all that information to use. So, you know, again, is it possible that evolution took place? No, it isn't. There's no evidence for it. And even if, you know, well, even apart from that, there, there's no way that we could conceive, no matter how much time you have, for energy, even if you could explain where the energy comes from and the matter comes from, no matter how much time this energy bombards this matter, it's not going to organize it. It's, it's just going to destroy it because that's what unbridled energy does. Stick your finger in a, in a you know, one of those um, wall sockets and see what energy does to, to matter. You know, don't do that, but... It, it uh, is not going to make you stronger. It's not going to make you more intelligent. If you get struck by lightning, you know, most people who uh, do usually die, I think. Or if they don't die, they usually are very severely uh, injured because it just ravages through your, your nervous system. Uh, that energy, just raw energy, does not improve the organism. It doesn't organize. It disorganizes. So that's not going to happen, um, no matter how much time you have. So anyway, are there any questions on this? Basically, we, we covered everything I think I, I wanted to cover. Let's see. There's, there's other things you can look at. But I close with this. I, I just say the dirt and water and solar energy, 
don't possess the, the attributes that uh, we see. You know, these attributes that we find in us, these attributes we find in the world, the information that we see, these things cannot explain what we see, okay? Uh, what can explain it, of course, is a being who is conscious and uh, volitional and personal and intelligent and moral and benevolent and angry and infinite, eternal and one, independent, unchangeable and infinitely powerful. Uh, he is the one that can explain what we see, where the information comes from. You know, we have, we have um, intelligence. I should say that whatever this being has, he has to have an infinite degree. So he has, because he's an infinite being, he has infinite intelligence and a gigabyte of information with a context and a mechanism to put it to use. <laughs> yeah, that's nothing for God. He has the ability to do that and uh, the power to create these things. We're talking about infinite, infinite power. Uh, there's nothing that God cannot do. I mean, if, if looking in a cell and considering the DNA molecule creates a crisis of faith, your God isn't big enough. God, I mean, the God that, that the Bible speaks of, the, the God that we see in creation and the one that should also be in our minds, at, at least in some degree, should be able to, to do that by by just willing it, you see, because he has, again, infinite power, infinite intelligence. He can call into being whatever he, he, he wills. And if he had made us out of a solid, let's say, living silly, you know, silly putty or, or something like that, uh, I suppose in, in some senses some people might have a better idea or, uh, let's say, be more easily convinced that God exists because there wouldn't be any reason for that silly putty to be alive. But the fact that he, he made such a complicated system and cells that do all of these things, I, I think don't, don't explain then how all this could happen accidentally, but again, reveal this, this God uh, that we know exists and the Bible tells us about, one of infinite power and intelligence. Well, that's a crash course in apologetics. I, I just wanted to add that at the end to um, hopefully get, if our youth who are paying attention, at least those that are here, uh, to see some of the reasons why um, we, we simply cannot uh, accept uh, even the possibility of evolution, uh, even a theistic evolution for that matter, because there's no evidence for that either. God could have chosen to do it that way, but there's no evidence that he did do it that way. We, there should be millions of missing links in the fossil record, not just one between apes and man. If evolution is true, you should have millions, you should have billions of missing links, of transitional life forms, and you don't have any in the fossil record. And when they, they find a, an animal that they think is one of our ancestors, what it really is is an extinct ape of some kind. Or I think it was a Neanderthal, uh, turned out to be an arthritic, uh, an arthritic man, uh, somebody, uh, you know, a group of people who lived to be old, and yeah, they got kind of bent over as they got older. You know, the bones began to bow a bit and the arthritis and everything. So every, every one of these fossil records, these supposed missing links or links between uh, apes and man have been disproven. Some turned out to be uh, complete hoaxes. Somebody took a jawbone of an ape and uh, filed the teeth until they looked like modern man type teeth and they accepted it and then when they came back years later and they looked at it again, they saw the file marks and they said, how did we miss these when we were looking at it the first time? Well, they missed it because they weren't looking for that. They were looking for evidence for evolution and they weren't willing to accept anything else. They found out that one tooth that they had that they thought was a tooth of one of our ancestors was actually a tooth of a pig and they had actually built a whole man around that tooth and a whole culture around it and uh, built the scene, you know, so if you went to a museum, you'd see, you know, this particular, was it Nebraska man, I think, uh, and it was ape-like face standing upright and and uh, all of his, his, we his weapons and his tools and his fire and whatever it is he lived in. And it turned out to be the tooth of a pig. So that's, that's what you get. You're looking for evolution, you'll find it. But uh, if you really look at the facts, you know, uh, and see them as for what they are, uh, I was gonna say without a bias, but really nobody does that. Um, you'll, you'll see that there's no evidence for it. So the complete lack of evidence for evolution, the absurdity of evolution, and really the reasonableness of a theistic worldview. This is the only way it could have possibly happened. God exists. There's, there's no question. As uh, one biology teacher said that it used to be in the past before evolution you know, became prominent, 
the cure for doubting that God existed was just simply to walk outside and look around. A blade of grass, how could you explain a blade of grass without God? You can't. There's no way it could exist apart from an infinitely intelligent and powerful creator. Okay. Any questions? Well, I hope that this was helpful, at least at, at some level, to, uh, again, reassure you that the evidence just screams for the existence of God. It's not, you know, some evolutionists say, where is God? I don't see him. Well, you know what? They do see him. They see him quite clearly. They even know he exists, but their sin is suppressing that knowledge because they don't want to face him, and that's why you have evolutionists. That's why you have people using their intelligence to try to cover it over. And God believes that they have sufficient information. So they're without excuse, and they will have nothing to plead on that day. They, they'll have no excuse that, that God will accept, um, even though they think they do. I think on that, again, expelled, you'll see Richard Dawkins saying, that, where is God? I don't see him. I don't see any evidence for him at all. And uh, there was something else ridiculous he said. I think it was the fact that evolution is a fact. It's, it's, you know, it's proven. And what's he looking at? You know, he's not looking at the, at the facts. But it's his sin speaking because he does not want to believe this. There, there is no evidence for, for evolution. So, Well, I don't see any questions, so let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we again thank you that um, we don't have...